Right, so this here is my Intel Core i3 that I nabbed off eBay this week. I never intended to be out here making another video on a 1P processor so soon, but sometimes that's just the way fate hands it to you. Anyway, the listing was an auction on eBay with a 1P starting price for a local processor that was listed as being for parts. So a perfect recipe for absolutely no one buying this thing or bidding. More so, if you actually want a working one, they're only 10p from CEX. So no one's really going to even take the time to bid on this thing other than me. So I ended up with this processor for just 1p. There really isn't anything all too interesting about this other than the fact that this signifies that the Intel Core i series has finally reached the levels we expect from the Core 2 Duo and the Pentium 4. They are now so cheap that people are nearly throwing them away. But given this was listed for spares there's always a chance that it doesn't work, and the description from the listing wasn't too helpful either, because there wasn't anything there. But anyways, I threw together a nice little LGA 1156 system, and we got everything all set up and ready to go. After a little while, things seemed hopeful. We had it all set up, and at first there was nothing. But suddenly we had a display, which then promptly vanished over and over again. It seemed almost like a power issue, so I thought maybe there's a chance it could be the cables going to the system, but those all checked out absolutely fine. Then I thought maybe it could be the graphics card tripping things out, so I tried not just one, but two different cards, even going as far as to throw in a GT1010, a card so basic that its main use can be described as just displaying a picture. And still nothing, it would just cut out randomly. I tried cleaning out the processor socket and testing it with the i7 that I used in this system before, and it worked fine with the i7, but didn't work with the i3. So all signs pointed to our little 1P processor being well and truly dead. That was until I thought maybe it could be the RAM, as that's the only thing we haven't changed. But it seems to be fine with every other processor, and this is brand new RAM. So I tried changing the sticks. Tried dropping it to 4GB, then 2GB, and everything seemed to not work. But suddenly, some absolutely abysmal DDR3 sticks clocking in at 1066MHz with a measly 1GB of RAM seemed to work. I have no clue why the system was stable and didn't crash. So I went back and I tried another 8GB stick, quickly rushing into the BIOS to reduce the clocks before it would crash. And nope, nothing. To get this all straight then, this 1P Core i3 does actually work, but something with the memory controller inside, which is what the Intel Core series introduced, means that it's so broken it will not work unless it is paired with 1GB sticks of RAM. Any more than this and the system will just crash randomly. So on the one hand, working Core i3 processor, but on the other hand, the best case scenario for this processor is a genuinely abysmal 4GB of RAM. You win some, you lose some. But still, at least on paper, it is more powerful than the Intel Celery we got last time, so maybe things could prove a little bit better for us over in the world of modern computing. Speaking of modern though, what actually are the specs of this here processor? Released now 14 years ago, it may not actually be as modern as the name sounds, but the Core i3-540 does actually still pack a bit of a punch. Based on the 32 nanometer Clarkdale architecture, it has two cores and fortunately four threads clocking in at just over 3 gigahertz. It does still have a relatively respectable 4 megabytes of cache, and other than that the most exciting thing is that it contains an Intel HD graphics chip which is something I suppose. You can pick them up in broken condition like today for either free or a whopping 1p that I paid, or you can nab a fully working one for just 10p. So these things are well and truly worthless. Turns out though, about 7 years ago we actually looked at the slightly better version of this i3 when it cost £2, and it performed alright. But in that time, things have really taken their toll, especially on dual-core processors. As even Windows 10, although fine we're not doing too much, opening programs and things felt like it could really bog down the system. It's not like we're doing too much, and we have given the system a fighting chance, as it's running a stripped-out version of Windows 10 on an SSD with a decent Radeon R9285. But anyway, 
all that really matters now is how far can we push a fairly broken and 1P Core i3 in the benchmarks. Starting things off, we have GTA 5, which suffered most with the RAM limitation of the chip. You know, the memory controller not working doesn't help here, and in simpler scenes it could be okay with the processor averaging in and around 30 FPS, which isn't actually too bad, but heavy stutters could render things nearly unplayable in places. For what it's worth here, there were large chunks of the game that were remarkably playable, and the last time we had a 1P processor, we were struggling to even see a singular frame. So we're not quite at playable levels yet in this price range, which is a ridiculous thing that I can even say this, but we're getting closer to GTA 5 running, at least running okay, on what is a 1P processor. It's also worth noting I did test Grand Theft Auto Online. However, the game would load, and it didn't matter how many players were in the lobby, it would crash and then freeze the system. So GTA Online acts more like a virus than a game. Trying to push things even further on Red Dead Redemption 2, and we managed to eventually get into game after a few attempts. A lot of the time the system was so slow that it would struggle to load Social Club and then would crash out the game because Social Club wasn't running. However, we did nearly manage to make it in game before we had an out of memory error that I haven't actually yet seen on this game. I didn't know that it could start loading and then throw up this error until now. I mean, we probably were being a tad optimistic here, but at least we know that this error can now happen. So for research purposes, that's kind of interesting. In a very surprising turn of events, BeamNG was surprisingly playable, even if it did take us a long time to load. When trying to push for the highest frame rates possible, simpler situations would net us in and around 100 FPS, with the CPU actually still having plenty of headroom left over, so it was only when we loaded things up into a more intensive map that the processor actually had some load on it. It could still have the occasional drop or spike, especially when foliage was clipping through the car or camera, but it was actually a surprisingly decent experience, and one that was really quite smooth no matter what we did. On the other hand, Counter-Strike 2 struggled to even load in files. After multiple attempts, we made it through to Valve's screen, but that's as far as we made it before we saw a slew of error messages. It's a shame, because this thing actually used to run Counter-Strike Go at well over 150 FPS back in the day, but that was now seven years ago. Fallout 4 was an alright experience, the game never really uses more than two cores for a lot of the main game mechanics, so to see it run here wasn't too much of a surprise. It did, however, bug out and lock the game to 30 FPS. Not too much of an issue, as it did give us a better average, as the game could still spike down to the mid-20s at times. So, a bit weird, a bit buggy, but then again, every Fallout 4 benchmark is its own unique, uncomparable piece. So, nearly 30 FPS is what I consider playable for Fallout 4 on a processor that is broken and worthless. To follow up with more disappointment, Baldur's Gate 3 took just over 48 minutes to load, and eventually when we did get in-game and change all the settings, we saw two brief glimpses of gameplay, mostly just single frames, and then the game turned into a strange white screen. Now that is what I call a real gaming experience. Classic games like Counter-Strike Source, on the other hand, were absolutely fantastic, with the processor managing about 196 FPS on average throughout the built-in benchmark. And honestly, things weren't too different when you actually went into real gameplay. For the world of Source games, these i3 processors were always fantastic, matching some of the best Core 2 Duo processors, and sometimes even beating them if you had any programs open in the background. So credit where it's due, we are managing a slightly competitive experience on what is a very cheap processor. And it didn't take me nearly an hour to launch it, which may be making me slightly biased towards favouring this. Mountain Blade Bannerlord was a modern title that actually ran alright too. Load times were monstrously ridiculous, but when you actually got in game, you could quite handedly manage some of the late game battles and even the built in benchmark. I have to admit that this game is ridiculously well optimised, maybe even more so than its predecessor, and yes, you could spend quite a bit of time waiting for towns to load in, and changing the scenery could be very slow, but when it came down to the core part of the gameplay itself, Somehow, this one PI3 is managing not only a decent experience, but a decent experience on a completely broken chip. 
RimWorld I actually forgot to write anything in the script about, so I'm here looking at the video right now, and performance was okay in the early game. Generally though, with larger colonies and as the game progresses, the tick rate becomes unbelievably slow, but that's not down to the i3's fault, that's more the game's optimization. It can, however, utilise nearly 100% of the processor, which is nice, but also speaks volumes about how the game only really uses two cores. The frame rate doesn't really matter here so much as the tick rate does, which is how fast the game actually progresses, and generally at 3 times speed it was okay, and at 4 times speed it struggled, so RimWorld works, but the late game is certainly going to be a challenge. Another one I forgot to write about was Minecraft, which also ran surprisingly well, but we did have to turn down the render rate and also turn the settings down to fast rather than fancy, as the latest version did struggle unbelievably so on the i3. We're talking anywhere from 15 to 20 FPS. However, with the settings turned down and the simulation distance also turned down, you can enjoy the latest version of Minecraft with a decent frame rate, even causing chaos. I think I decided to set fire to a forest to really stress things out, and the frame rate remained okay throughout. So it's nice to see Minecraft, even in its latest iterations, is still playable on a 1P processor. But can it run Crisis? Well, yes it can. Performance is nowhere up there with the likes of higher clocked Core 2 Duos, where those really quite decent versions can run rings around this Core i3, which is likely why they've gone forgotten for so long. But generally, we managed to see around 30 FPS during combat with explosions and physics effects going on, but after that we would see anywhere up to 50 FPS, which isn't too bad at all. And the idea that Crisis itself one of the most intensive games of all time, runs on a 1P processor, is still a novel concept to me that boggles the mind. So there we have it, the benchmarks. And honestly, what can I tell you? I started this video and went into it expecting it to not work. And I assumed it was going to be a wasted day and there probably wouldn't be a video this week. But in reality, this was actually a surprisingly competent experience. I mean, don't get me wrong, we desperately needed more RAM, but with that questionable memory controller, this is as good as we're going to get here. And the main takeaway from this is the load times. Oh my lord, the load times. We haven't had anything that took this long to load since the abysmal Celeron D. I don't know if maybe there's more wrong with this processor than the memory controller, or it's failing in such a unique way that it's actually affecting core-to-core -core latency. I don't even think it can do that, but who knows. But our load times range from anywhere from acceptable through to nearly an hour. And this was over an SSD. GTA 5 took around 10 minutes to load, Red Dead was around 25 minutes, and Baldur's Gate set the record at 48 minutes. 48 minutes waiting for it to load. Constantly monitoring it to make sure it didn't crash. I was just happy to see the start screen. Things like Counter-Strike Source was still slow though, which they really shouldn't be given the i3 is overkill for them, and we still have plenty of RAM left over there, so it makes me think there is more broken here than just the RAM limitation, as something is affecting the data throughput and I'm not too sure what it is. Given the system seemed to cope just about okay with gaming, I did use the PC a little bit just to browse the web and see how things were going there, and things were definitely questionable at best. Compared to the i7 of this generation, these i3s are really feeling their age now. Last time I used one of these, they were still snappy and responsive, but now, even with a cut down version of Windows, things struggled. Yes, they still work fine, and they may last for now, but it's about time to consider retiring these types of machines for daily use. Yes, there is the world of Linux, but most people stuck on one of these are going to be people that bought pre-built machines. Doris on her HP Compact from 14 years ago isn't going to figure out how to compile Gen 2. She's just not going to be able to do it. She doesn't understand how her printer works. She's not going to be able to install Linux to make her i3 feel snappy. They can still somewhat admirably handle things like streaming and recording, but only in older titles, and they will cause major frame drops when you do do it, often using around 70% of the CPU usage just to encode a sub-720p file. I mean, there's not too many people out there that are going to be doing that, and I just thought maybe it'd be a fun little challenge to round things off with, given how little we spent on it, and just how little I expected. 
That there brings us to the end of this little adventure. I really didn't want to make this a long video because, honestly, it's a broken processor. The main interest here is seeing just how well it performs, there's no point challenging it further. It's not really indicative of the i3 either because this thing is struggling to even post unless given specific RAM and a lot of time spent troubleshooting. I mean, I can compare it to the One Piece Celeron we had and it completely decimated that, but at least over there we had some fun overclocking. Here, it was just a painful struggle to keep things moving and not crashing. I can't go and say buy one of these broken i3s because let's be honest if one does come up no one else is going to bid on it and sure you can get one for 1p but honestly just look underneath one of those coin machines find nine more p and go and buy a working one because they're only 10p for a working one in fact if you've got a pound you can pick up an i7 of this generation for just 75p so there is very little reason to do this outside a strange, slow, painful experience from what can only be decided as the most powerful 1P processor that exists at the moment. Maybe we'll find more, but for now, thank you all for watching. I hope you've all enjoyed this little adventure, and good night.